Welcome to another edition of To The Point Podcast. So everybody had a great weekend as we went through the super wild card weekend in the NFL and it will wrap up this evening. Uh, we, we've been through five of the six games. It'll conclude tonight with the uh, Arizona Cardinals visiting the Los Angeles Rams at SoFi Stadium. So that's tonight. Also this weekend, we saw the Florida Panthers, uh, you know, dominate the NHL like like no other. Jonathan Huberto has been, you know, quietly climbing the the point total, the point leaders in the NHL. He continues to be on a tear. The team is just dominating the NHL right now as they prepare to head out on a Western Canadian road trip. Um, so a lot, lot happened this weekend. You had some golf. You had uh, Russell Henley choke away another tournament last night uh, at the Sony Open in Hawaii. Hideki Matsuyama wins his third tournament in a calendar year. Australian Open has started, so that that started already a few upsets. We got the whole Novak Djokovic of it all, and you know, there's also the NFL, and that's a lot's happened this weekend. You have the the Patriots fall the buffalo bills completely demolishing the patriots and you know i'm sure the some narratives stay or well is it is it over for new england that's always how it goes is it is it over for this team then you saw the retirement of big ben roethlisberger where it really is over his career is you know it's gone out to pasture it's over for big ben you know 18 years in pittsburgh two super bowls three appearances and you can book it a trip to uh, to Canton, Ohio, to the uh, to the Hall of Fame. Then you also get a great game between you know the Cincinnati Bengals and Las Vegas Raiders. That comes down to the wire. You have all weekend officiating that I that you could argue was pretty terrible. And there's all kind of storylines, all kind of uh, of headlines, like statements, teams, you know, making you think: Is this the team that's going to go all the way? But through all that, through all the headlines, through all the monotonous talk of great teams, great players, you know, some things change. Curses are broken. For instance, in 2010, the Chicago Blackhawks broke a streak of 50 years without winning the Stanley Cup when they defeated the Philadelphia Flyers. The Georgia Bulldogs in early 2022, ended a 41-year drought and winning a national championship against the Alabama Crimson Tide. The Atlanta Braves winning a World Series in over, for over for the first time in 26 years. Streaks are broken. But in sports, there are, there are, pro, there are teams. There are monikers. There are just things that you think about when you think of certain teams. And... You know, that could be the Toronto Maple Leafs and not be able to get out of their own way, not be able to win a first round series, not getting to a Stanley Cup in 50 plus years. You could say it's the, the New York Yankees and the fact that nobody gets talked about more in baseball and yet they haven't won a World Series in over a decade. But and there's more to that. There's the New York Knicks. Why do we talk about the Knicks so much? They have been an eyesore for decades. But then there's a team that's bigger than all the ones I just mentioned. The Knicks are the mecca of basketball at New York. Still not bigger than the team I'm about to talk about. Toronto is the hub of hockey in the world. Still not bigger than the team we're going to talk about today. And for a long period of time, the Dallas Cowboys were the gold standard. They were what you wanted to be. Jerry Jones, the cool new owner, who for some reason thought it would be a good idea to name himself president and general manager. Worked out for a while because he hired a coach that was brilliant, that was a Hall of Famer in Jimmy Johnson, but since departing from Jimmy Johnson and that season, they fired him halfway. Barry Switzer took over. They won the Super Bowl. But that was Jimmy's team. Since that firing, 
The Dallas Cowboys have won three playoff games in a 25-year span. The Dallas Cowboys. How about them Cowboys? The Cowboys of Tony Romo. <laughs> Des Bryant. DeMarcus Ware. Hall of Fame type players. Three playoff wins. They haven't been to an NFC championship game since 1995. 1995. And I even bought in this year. I said the Dallas Cowboys are loaded with talent, which I still believe to be true. Dak Prescott, when he wants to play, is a top 10 quarterback. C.D. Lamb. Amari Cooper, Dalton Schultz. They have two Hall of Famers in their offensive line, in Tyron Smith and Zach Martin. Micah Parsons is going to win Defensive Rookie of the Year. A buzzsaw out of Penn State. Demarcus Lawrence, no slouch. Randy Gregory had a great year and a great story after being in rehab and battling his demons to get back on the field. But it doesn't matter that you change coaches, you change quarterbacks, you change your foundation. Things have remained the same for this Cowboy team. They fall short in the biggest moments. And yesterday they fall to the San Francisco 49ers in a home playoff game. And I... I look at this and there's a lot of blame to go around. And does Dak Prescott deserve a lot of the blame yesterday? Yes. He didn't play well, point blank. But in this 25 year span, who's hiring the people? Who's choosing the quarterbacks? Who's making the trades? That would be Jerry Jones. And What's so funny about this is that Jerry Jones wants, you know, he's talked about his football, football mortality and how he's getting older and he doesn't know how much longer he's going to be in the game of football. Well, like his clock, he's the one holding himself back from getting another title. The worst thing you can do as an owner is get involved in personnel decisions. You are an owner, you're great at business, clearly you have money or you inherited the team and your dad or your grandfather was great at making money. Either way, you're rich. But if you want to win, if you want to be successful, you gotta let personnel people, you gotta let experts, you gotta let people that know the sport better than you run the show and that might be tough on the ego that might be tough for people to accept but there are people with just as big of ego as jerry jones who have done this and i point to mark cuban and same same state the dallas mavericks yes they've only won one title but mark cuban if you watch shark tank the man loves to be in control he has a certain demeanor about him and It's either you're going to do it my way or not, but he had to make the choice. I would rather win a Larry O'Brien trophy than have my little fingers in the pot. I'm going to let Rick Carlisle coach. I'm going to let my general manager make decisions. And what did it do? It got him a title in 2011. Jerry has been buying the groceries. Jerry has been shopping. He's been throwing, throwing out the groceries after they're done. He's had every decision along the way. Has he had people tell him this is not a good idea? Sure. You look back to the Johnny Manziel draft. Jerry Jones really wanted Johnny Manziel. And Stephen Jones, his son, to his credit, said, no, this guy's got demons, alcohol, drugs. And I, I'm as big a Johnny Manziel fan as there is. But he said, no, we can't do this. It's not a smart decision, Jerry. Let's draft Zach Martin. Zach Martin's going to the Hall of Fame. So you do, you land into good decisions. But 
every year. Well, it just it was Tony Romo's fault. Well, then it was Jason Garrett's fault. And now it's now, am I going to talk about the game and Mike McCarthy's decisions yesterday? Yeah. He made a lot of bad decisions. But who hired Mike McCarthy? Jerry Jones. It all comes down to hire. You got to hire smart people. But if the person that is hiring these people is not that smart, maybe there's something to that. The New York Giants, it's inspiring Toff Coughlin, have hired bozo after bozo to run their football operations, to coach their team. Is John Mara that smart? He isn't a me. His decisions that he makes outside of football when it comes to his personal life, when it comes to his ethics, that doesn't sit well with me. And that's not going to be something that I think, okay, you're a smart person because you have this opinion of people that aren't white. Um, but I think there's something to it. Jerry Jones wishes he was a coach. He wishes he was Tom Landry. He wishes he was Bill Parcells, Bill Belichick, but he isn't. You're not the genius that bought a team and then can run it. What owner does media availability every week? The only one in pro sports, Jerry Jones. And other organizations that fail. I've talked about this a lot. I mean, what has Buffalo done forever? They haven't won either. The Pagulas, do they really know hockey? They look like they've figured out the football part when it comes to hiring smart people. But when it comes to their hockey decisions, they hired a coach that was coaching soccer at the time. I don't know if that, to me, that just doesn't scream. This is a, you can't miss, can't miss hire Ralphie Kruger. But that's the bigger story today to me is, and the bitter irony is, this will never get better until Jerry Jones can park his ego and say, you know what? I can't be the one doing this anymore because 25 years is not a small sample size. 25 years of losing when you're there the whole time. Pro sport, it's very hard to win. Very hard. But it's also very hard to only have three playoff wins in 25 years. His division rivals, the New York Giants and the Philadelphia Eagles, have a combined three Super Bowls in a decade span. That is the same division Jerry Jones is in. That's one of the worst divisions in football. But yet, those Two organizations that Jerry hates more than any other have succeeded while he continues to fail. Was Jason Garrett a great coach? No, I, I don't think so. But why did Jerry Jones keep him employed for eight seasons when for five of those seasons he went eight and eight? Mediocrity at its finest. Why? Because you like the guy? Because he used to be a backup quarterback to Troy Aikman? Pro sports is not about, okay, well, this guy's a really nice person. There's great people in every walk of life, but business is business. Was Tony Romo a great quarterback? No. He was a uh, you know, great story, undrafted out of Eastern Michigan. But should he have been there that long? To, in my opinion, no, because he never, you ne watching Tony Romo, you never thought, okay, Tony Romo is going to be the one to get you over the hump. And that leads us into the conversation about Dak Prescott. And I thought he had played really well in every playoff game he had competed in until yesterday. He beat Russell Wilson in the playoff game. He had a shootout with Aaron Rodgers at Lambeau. He was down 21-3, rallied, and they lose on a walk-off 58-yard field goal. Pretty, pretty good effort on the road. He lost to the Rams in L.A. Wasn't his best game, but he played pretty well. 
But I look at the team yesterday. Coming into the season, the strength of the Dallas Cowboys team was their offense, for sure. You have Dak Prescott, the $75 million quarterback. You have Amari Cooper, who had just signed a $100 million extension. You have C.D. Lamb, who you took in the first round. You have Michael Gallup, uh, Blake Jarwin, Dalton Schultz. Again, a great offensive line. But throughout the season and yesterday, the offense held them back. Ezekiel Elliott doesn't have that burst anymore. But I will say they didn't run the ball enough yesterday. That's my first complaint with Kellen Moore, the offensive coordinator. Zeke made some really creative cuts. And he created holes. He relied too much on the pass game because it just wasn't working. There wasn't creativity. There wasn't plays where I went, okay, Dak and the offense really looked dialed in. I mean, he threw 43 passes yesterday. He is undefeated. Dak Prescott is undefeated in his career when the Cowboys run the balls, have more rushing attempts than passing attempts. Well, let's put this into context. Yesterday, it was 43 pass attempts to 21 rush attempts. That's just not enough. That's not enough. And part of the problem, and Dak Prescott is prone to doing this, he got down early in the game. Before we know it, it's 10 nothing, 13 nothing, And yet you have to come back. And when you're down large points, when you're – in a, you're, when you're in a hole, you're forced to throw the football a ton because you feel because you, you can't run the clock off too much. You, and you're very you're boxed in and what you can do offensively. So that's problem number one. Yes, the, the defense gave up an opening drive touchdown. But what did the Cowboys first possession to possession do? Oh, yeah. Lost 13 yards. Nick Bosa sack. But. I look for the game. Dak threw a touchdown pass to Amari Cooper on the second to last drive of the first half. But there's a couple big plays in the game where I look at first, end of the first half. You're down 17 to 7. But you can make this game very, very intriguing because you have the ability to, um, to get some points here. You, you can put up some points. You can put, make it a one-possession game. You get the ball to start the second half. All of a sudden, you have a lead, even in, in a first half, where the offense had nothing going. But he takes a sack when they have all three timeouts on third down. Throw the ball. Live to see another down. That's that smart court. What does Tom Brady do better than anybody? He at least knows his, you know your situation. It's second and five. Throw the ball away. Aaron Rodgers, he'll throw the ball into the eighth row. He doesn't care. It's an incompletion. But guess what? The next down, it's third and five. It's not third and 26. And how many times did we see the Cowboys be in third and long yesterday? Some of that was Dak because he got sacked four times. Wasn't all his fault because the offensive line had a bad day. But you look at it. 14 penalties for 89 yards yesterday. 14 And for the Cowboys fans out there that think that they got hosed, you didn't get hosed. You got outplayed. And how about you say, hey, Connor Williams, can you not take two false start penalties? Hey, Connor Williams, can you not take a holding penalty? Hey, Lyle Collins, hey, Randy Gregory, can you not jump offside twice that both ended up resulting in first downs? Maybe. But then Dak Prescott, third quarter throws an interception for Quan Williams it wasn't a good throw next play Debo Samuel touchdown but there's all this and the fourth quarter is the meat and potatoes of this game because the Cowboys had a chance to win they shouldn't have but that brings us to San Francisco and as you guys all know, I like to have my little affectionate nickname for Jimmy Garoppolo, as I like to call him Porn Star Jimmy, because he uh, took a porn star on a date a few years ago. That's not a slight, by the way. That's eh, good for him, you know. Eh, doing better than, uh, than homeboy here. So good for Jimmy. But 
he's a quarterback that is good, but he's not great. And the game, you know, Cowboys got nothing going, nothing. And he rolls out bootleg and throws a ball that he's looking for Trent Sherfield, but he's got three guys. It's a really tough throw. And he doesn't have the biggest arm in the world, but they tip the ball, tip the ball. Um, Anthony Brown comes down with it. It leads to a touchdown. Dak Prescott runs it in. All of a sudden, it's a one possession game. Just like that, it's 23-17. With a touchdown, the Cowboys would take the lead with a touchdown and extra point. This is where we get to the Cowboys run frustrated again. Fourth quarter, two drives, fourth and very short, they punt the ball. I don't get it. What did Coach Herm always say? You play to win the game. You go for it. Fourth and one, you don't go for it? Dak Prescott, quarterback sneak. He's a big dude. He's not, you're not going to tackle him. You're getting the yard. Fourth and, th- fourth and two, you punt. And you say, well, they came back to win the game. No, you wouldn't be saying that. Well, they didn't. I, in real time, I'm watching the game with my parents saying, why the hell are they punting again? Because it wasn't like the San Francisco 49ers were having short. The average drive for the San Francisco 49ers yesterday was five and a half minutes. What did they do? Their uh, second to last possession of the day, it went five and a half minutes. Cowboys got the ball back with 258 and sorry, 251 left when uh, Leighton Van Der Esch made a great tackle on Debo Samuel, keep him short of uh, one yard short of the first down read around midfield. But what happens again? Then this is the, the pandemonium of the game. Cowboys go for it on, uh, on fourth down. They don't convert when um, Cedric Wilson slips on his route, looking for the big play turnover. But then Cowboys still have three timeouts, 49ers using their uh, diverse run game, give it to Debo Samuel. He picks up nine and a half yards. And on the fourth and inch, Jimmy Garoppolo is going to quarterback sneak for the first down, but Trent Williams, who's normally a great left tackle, got his second penalty of the day. One for false start this one, he just wasn't lined up properly. And that makes it fourth and six, and then they have to punt. And this is where it gets interesting. Because the Cowboys start picking up yardage. couple plays, Dalton Schultz, wide open, C.D. Lamb, who had a, a brutal day, you know, dropping the football, just was completely out of it. He gets a play. So then we get to 14 seconds on the clock. Cowboys have no timeouts, as does San Francisco. So you're thinking, okay, you have 14 seconds. You can at least run one more play to the sideline before you start throwing the ball to the end zone for the potential Hail, Hail Mary. So I'm thinking, okay, well, they've been getting lots of yardage. So just throw it to Dalton Schultz, give him five or six. Dak's going to have like a 35-yard throw. No problem. And you take your chance out. If you get the touchdown, you kick an extra point, you win, you walk it off. But what you see, they snap the ball. The defense is playing prevent. So there's tons of, tons of running room. But Dak Prescott runs for the middle of the field. And he slides. You know, he runs for a, a long while, nearly to nearly the 20 yard line. He slides with about six seconds left on the clock. So then they're rushing, trying to get the ball. But what does he do? He gives the football to his center, Tyler Biotic, does not hand it to the referee who's trailing. And the referee is far behind because I don't think he thought any chance that. They'd run the football into the middle of the field. This is exactly what San Francisco wants. Chew the clock, you idiots. So Dak, he's trying to get it. The the ref scrambling, trying to get past the O-line. By the time Dak spikes the football, it's already the clock's at zero. The game is over. Couple things. Number one, I do not think the Cowboys got hosed on this play. I, uh, I heard that after the game. Um, no, I, this was a number one. Well, I just said number one. This is number two then. Don't put the game in the hands of the referee. Don't. 
because you'll always be disappointed more often than not. I've learned that in my days of sports. Do not leave it to the discrepancy of the official. Make a play and get out of bounds. Guess what? The clock stops. There's no, okay, well, what happened here? It, the clock stopped. You get a play. Don't put it on the official to get his ass to that line of scrimmage so that you can spike the ball. Dak was just a stupid play. It was stupid. If you had 30 seconds, totally get it. Totally get it. Because you have enough. To, you had 14 seconds. And if you want to run this play, which I would never recommend, but if you do, take eight less yards. Slide, spike it. You get a chance to throw to the end zone. This was not on the referees. This was on Kellen Moore, Dak Prescott, and Mike McCarthy. It's just coaching and quarterback. It's called situational awareness. If Dak just decided to do this on a, on a whim, that's, that's completely on him. And I like him. I think he's a good, I think he's a great leader. But this was just a poor judgment. Your season's on the line. Call a play to the sideline. Or if nothing's there and you're, you're sitting in the pocket, throw the ball away. Again, clock stops. You have a chance to throw it to the end zone. The game doesn't end on the clock just ending. That's not on the officials. That's on you. However, if Kellen Moore called this play, Dak Prescott hears it, you know, it's in his earpiece, and Mike McCarthy does not cancel the play, he said, no, no, kill, kill. He, he has to take the wrath of this too. Because he had a, I, I mentioned the punts. That's his decision. I like the fake punt. I could tell it was coming for a number of series because I saw special teams coach John Fossil talking to Mike McCarthy. I'm surprised that the 49ers weren't more aware of this. I mean, they were talking very close. The punt before that they the punt before they faked it. So I thought that was a miscue on the 49ers. But this is coaching. Being aware of the situation. He's had clock management problems all year. His using of the timeouts in the first half when he didn't use any, and then they run a third nine when the clock's ticking down and it's an incomplete. And guess what? San Francisco gets the ball back. Call a timeout, run a play, get your team ready. You have three timeouts. You don't need to carry them to the second half. This isn't like vacation days. You're done. When you have your three timeouts, there's not six when you get to the second half. It's still three. Use them. So that was stupid, but this is just Cowboys doing Cowboy things. And I, it's truly, I, you can tell there's a bit of frustration in my voice because I truly felt this team could go to the Super Bowl. I really did. They have more talent than any team remaining. And they're out. They have more, ta I, they have more talent than, than Green Bay. D definitely. I love Devontae Adams, but is Alan Lazard better than Amari Cooper? No. Is Alan Lazard better than C.D. Lamb? No. Is Mercedes Lewis better than Dalton Schultz? No. Green Bay is missing two starting offensive linemen. Tyron Smith and Zach Martin are healthy. They're going to Canton, Ohio. Tampa Bay. Yeah, they got Brady. Of course, but Mike Evans is great. But after that, it gets pretty thin. Bashad Perriman, Old Gronk, Cam Brake. This should be, and Jerry Jones did say this, that this one stung a little more, and it should, because this team was really good. And this team, I shouldn't have to talk about the Jerry Jones curse and the fact that he builds these rosters. And it's full of talent. It is. But you can have all the talent in the world. If you don't win, it's jack shit. It means nothing. The Colorado Avalanche are going to be under the same pressure as these Dallas Cowboys in my mind. Because they are loaded with top-end talent. Like the Toronto Maple Leafs. Like the Florida Panthers. In basketball, I would say the team that's under is Brooklyn. You load up on talent, you're expected to win the championship. 
If you go through a long period of time and you don't, you are a failure. It's, it hasn't been a success. The Cowboys this year win a, win a bad division, but then you get to this point and you're still failing. You play a 49ers team that, by most counts, Jimmy G, porn star Jimmy, he's not an elite quarterback. Their best player is a wide receiver who plays running back in Debo Samuel. That's San Francisco's best player. They, for the last two drives and for the entire second half, San Francisco did not have their best pass rusher in Nick Bosa, and they didn't have their middle linebacker, who's an absolute stud in Fred Warner. And yet you still, you can't take advantage of the defense? It's a doomsday. It's a bad day if you're a Cowboys fan. And I think a lot of days are, because you know, you know the cycle every year. Cowboys. Well, we're going to win the Super Bowl week one. And then, you know, after a few weeks when you play really bad teams, you're like, yeah, we feel really good about this. And then when you get to the playoffs, it's a eh, gag. It's, it's, a, it's a theme. Not everybody can be New England, but it's really hard to only get three playoff wins in a, in 25 years. In a quarter century. Just for reference, Colin Kaepernick had six seasons as a starting quarterback in the NFL. He's got four playoff wins. Jake DeLone has five in that same time frame. Bruce Johnson has four. Found that, found that today. Fun little statistic from Get Up ESPN. But um yeah, I mean, San Francisco advances. Um, they tried to lose this game. They really did. It shouldn't have been that close. Um, but their defense held up. Debo Samuel. I mean, for San Francisco, I love the way they use Debo, but they need to use him more in the running game. I like Elijah Mitchell, but use Debo creatively. You want, ha- you want him to have the ball in his hands as often as he possibly can because he always does something spectacular. Look, he had a rushing touchdown in the game. Where, I mean, he – he, his cuts are so powerful. He's such a great player, such a unique player. But I look ahead. San Francisco is the sixth seed. They will meet Green Bay um, Saturday night. That'll be a 9-15 kickoff. This is the worst possible matchup for the Green Bay Packers that they could have asked for. I think if you ask them if they have a gun to their head, they would rather play Arizona, the Rams. They'd rather play the Cowboys. And the reason I say that is a couple things. San Francisco is the most creative team at running the football. Kyle Shanahan knows what he's doing. You look at at the third and 10 play where it's normally just get you run ahead. You try to choose some clock. They'll take a timeout. He gives it to Debo Samuel and they pick up nine. They're so close to the first down. Nobody saw that one coming. It was a really creative run play. But the way they use Debo, their bootleg game, Elijah Mitchell using cuts, using Brandon Ayuk, who had a, who's having a great season out of Arizona State. Um, and what does Green Bay struggle with? Stopping the run. That is their biggest – their defense is much improved. But it's much improved when it comes to pass coverage. Jair Alexander, Rasul Douglas, Eric Stokes, their corners have really locked down people. They had a great game against DeAndre Hopkins. They really, they did well on Adam Thielen, on Justin Jefferson. But you look against Cleveland, Green Bay should have lost that game. And they would have if Cleveland just ran the ball more. If Kevin Stefanski didn't throw it in the injured Baker Mayfield's hands 45 times, they win that game. He has a brain in that moment. But he didn't do it. But Kyle Shanahan's not going to be that stupid. He knows if we're going to have a chance here, we're going to control time of possession. Elijah Mitchell, Debo Samuel, Ayuk, whomever, you're going to run this pigskin. And it's going to be cold in, in Lambeau, for sure. And the last three matchups have come um, at Levi Stadium. And um, San Francisco's gone 2-1 and one in those matchups. Green Bay did win there earlier this year on a walk-off field goal. But I think Green Bay should be favored, but this is a tough matchup. They don't want this. 
they would rather have played anybody else. They would rather play the Rams, who I think will beat the Cardinals tonight. We'll wait, wait to see on that one. But um, it's it's a matchup that's going to be difficult for 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 the uh, for the Packers for sure when they meet up on Saturday evening. Um, also, you know, talk about the NFC a little bit more here. Obviously, it'll wrap up tonight when it comes to the playoffs. But Tampa Bay routes the Philadelphia Eagles. The game could have been a lot closer, but Jalen Hurts did not have a great performance yesterday. They were just ended up being 31 15 it wasn't that close Jalen Hurts threw two inter- two interceptions including one in the end zone um they couldn't run the football which is their bread and butter you know but um you know I think they had a, actually had a positive season you know they made the playoffs Jalen Hurts had, had a had some progression they didn't, weren't expected to make the playoffs and they did but also they have three picks in the top 19 of this year's draft so if they were going to package some picks to try to go get a veteran quarterback, it would be Philly. They have all the, the tools to do it. We'll see if they're interested in doing that. That'll be really the story of their offseason. If they stick with Jalen Hurts, which I think is a good idea, you know, despite his poor game yesterday. But, you know, the team didn't play well in front of him either. But Tampa Bay, again, they, they smoked the Eagles. Tom Brady, pretty great day, 29 for 37, 271, two touchdowns. Um, Keish, they ran the ball a lot for for uh, for a Tampa Bay football team. They ran the ball 31 times yesterday. Um, Keyshawn Vaughn and Giovanni Bernard both had a rushing touchdown. Uh, Tom Brady throwing receiving touchdowns to Mike Evans and Rob Gronkowski. But what really impressed me, what was noteworthy about yesterday's game for the Buccaneers side of things, they won big. That was great. But I saw glimpses of what their defense did to win the Super Bowl last year, and that's played fast. You look at a guy like Antoine Winfield Jr., Jordan Whitehead. Their linebackers were flying yesterday, getting to the football. Shaq Barrett had a sack. He had a good day. But they were playing against a mobile quarterback who's not going to be easy to bring down, and they had no problem with him. You know, they stopping the run. They loaded that box, and the Miles Sanders wasn't going to get more than a yard rushing because they were there in his face and they limited any big plays, any the running game, getting any kind of traction. So this defense isn't as great as it once was, but I did see, you know, you, you can get hot at the right time. And if you have an offense that's really good, which Tampa's has been pretty consistent all year and the defense can start to come together and Shaq Barrett, Levante David, played yesterday he's he's so important to their defense he's the signal caller back there um mike edwards had an interception uh in the end zone with a great play closing on the football when the uh jalen hurts was throwing to Devonte smith but i that's what my biggest takeaway for the for the bucks was your the defense looked inspired it looked ready to play it looked like it had passion and they took advantage of a, of a poor team and they took away their strength and for looking ahead, they're either going to play the Rams or the Cardinals, depending on who wins tonight. Well, if they play the Cardinals, they're going to be playing a very similar quarterback to the one they just beat. Um, you know, Kyler Murray um, is, I'd say, a little bit more, is a little quicker, not so much faster than Jalen Hurts, but he's a little guy. He's tough to, to bring down. When they're healthy, they got James Conner and Chase Edmonds. And that's when they're at their best, Arizona, when they can run the football, when we'll see what they can do tonight against a very stout Rams defense or a bunch of really good players. But when they have options to run the football with James Conner, with Edmonds, with Kyler Murray, who, who's always a threat to run, it opens up possibilities that you can find Rondell Moore, that you can find Christian Kirk downfield, Zach Ertz, who's become one of the top targets for uh, Kyler Murray. So that would be an easier game plan for Tampa where they could say our defense, we're going to do similar things as we did last week. Well, in terms of the Rams, Matthew Stafford, the team is not a huge running the football team. They're very similar to Tampa where they rely heavily on their quarterback. Well, that would be problematic for me because Matthew Stafford against Tom Brady, I mean, Matthew Stafford is a turnover machine. He's got seven interceptions in the last three games. Tom Brady doesn't turn the ball over very often, especially in playoff games in the biggest moments. 
Stafford hasn't won a playoff game yet. We'll see if he can do that this evening. But I, I think the, they would rather play the Cardinals because, again, they don't have to change their matchup too much. The Rams, if they can find it, their defense has a much more potential to cause havoc than the Cardinals do. You know, J.J. Watt will return tonight, but he hasn't played in a month and a half. Uh, Buda Baker, I love, but their corners, you, know, you go up, you got Jalen Ramsey, who's a, the best corner in football. You have Aaron Donald, who's the best defensive player in football. Leonard Floyd, you have guys that can disrupt Brady, that can make his day a very tough one, where I look at, you know, Chandler Jones and J.J. Watt are good, but I do think Tom Brady will have a lot of time to throw the football and you will look yesterday, you know, the second quarter, Brady didn't have a great quarter because he got sacked three times. That offensive line lost Tristan Wirfs, the right tackle, who had played every snap up to yesterday when he got injured on the fifth play of the game. So it'll be interesting to follow all week if he's going to be available because that's a huge part of their, you know, of their offensive line alongside Ryan Jensen, who was also banged up yesterday. But the Bucks will host the winner of tonight's game at four next weekend in Tampa Bay. That brings us to the AFC. And, you know, I, I was a, a person that gave the Patriots maybe a little too much credit as I look back because, you know, they went 10 and seven, but you look, they lost two games to the Dolphins and they lost to the, they lost in overtime to the Cowboys. And, you know, down the stretch, they did get some victories, and I saw some really good things. I mean, at times this year, their defense was elite. It, it played fantastic. But there's also games where I looked at, okay, they beat the Falcons. Okay. They, they destroyed the Titans. No Derrick Henry, no great running game yet, but they did win. That's an impressive win. Uh, they beat the Bills in Buffalo. But then after, after that win against the Bills in Buffalo – they lose to the Colts in a game where the Colts didn't play fantastic. That was a, that was a tough sign. Then they played. We'll see. Then they lose to the Bills at home on Boxing Day. Then they rebound and beat the Jags 50 to 10. But the Jags were the worst team in football. And like I just mentioned, they lose to the Dolphins. So down the stretch and throughout the season, Mac Jones got progressively worse. He didn't play as well as he did from weeks seven till 13 he was starting to throw more interceptions not see the field as well and also team said you know what we see that mac is a good quarterback but he also has his limitations and he finished the year with 22 touchdowns but with 13 interceptions which tied for 19th in football so that's not a good um that's not a very good numbers to have he also was 16th in quarterback rating so right around you know the mid mid pack but and saturday saturday night it was total domination 47 17 again the game it shouldn't even been that close but you knew it was coming because josh allen and i really wrote this down I, i make notes of every game and i so i can remember i do have a good memory that's one thing i'll we'll give myself credit for but Josh Allen had the game of his career on Saturday night. He, I don't know how he could have played better. He was surgical. And when you watch, when I think about that game, and I rewatched it um, yesterday because I, why not? Um, He, if he plays this way, he's not going to play this well next weekend against Kansas City. But if he plays even slight, you know, just a little, if he plays consistent, if he's completing 60 to 65% of his passes, if he's not turning the ball over, if he's making smart decisions when to run the football, this Buffalo Bills team can represent the AFC in the Super Bowl. And not only that, they could win it this year. And I'm starting to see that, but again, it's, it's been tough to make that statement this year with Josh Allen, but you look, he went 21 for 25, 308, five touchdowns. He was one of two quarterbacks this weekend, two F5 touchdown passes, which is pretty crazy to think about, but he also ran the ball six times for 66 yards. He was dominant. 
Singletary is running. They are running the football. And that's one of the biggest things for Buffalo. They never ran the football other than Josh Allen. But Singletary ran 16 times. Could have ran more. But 16 is not bad. And look, they had 25 pass plays, 20, 26, 26 rushes. So that's a really, that's a really good mix. They can do it. Dawson Knox has improved so much. He had two touchdown receptions. Gabe Davis, Emmanuel Sanders, uh, Tim Doyle, the, the a big man touchdown, got one as well. They just spread, he spreads the ball around. And He's got great targets. Again, he's got a running game. The defense is still very good. Micah Hyde, his play on the interception when Mac Jones threw a deep ball for Nelson Aguilar at, at the end of the first quarter, and he just snagged, he stole it from him. I mean, that one, that was a great throw, but he just made a better play, a veteran safety coming out of nowhere, making a play. That was special. You look, they don't have Tredavious White, but they're still making great plays. Their pass rush starting to get home. Ed Oliver played big on uh, on Saturday night. And they just couldn't get anything done. Matt Milano is a great line. He flies up, flies to the football. And I think the Bills, if he played, and it's going to be the game of the weekend next weekend in my best, going to be Kansas City Buffalo at 730 next Sunday night. These two quarterbacks met in the AFC Championship game last year. They both didn't have great seasons, but they will meet again. And quite frankly, I think Buffalo's got the better team. I haven't been big. I predicted before the season that Kansas City would get back to the Super Bowl. And I, I picked Kansas City, Tampa Bay. So I'm not going to back off that because I, if I'm right, that, that's nice. It rematch the Super Bowl. But Buffalo, Mahomes looked good last night, but it took him a quarter and a half to get going. I mean, he was playing against a good defense. But can the defense, Kansas City's defense makes a lot of mistakes. A lot. They have a lot of Sorensen on the defense is a really, really weak part that you can take advantage of in the middle. When Chris Jones isn't going, the pass rush just isn't there. But I think this game will be close. I can't wait to watch it. I think, it's, like I said, I think it's going to be the game of the weekend. But kudos to, to, to Buffalo. And, you know, the sky's not falling in New England because they went seven and nine. They drafted a rookie quarterback, and they're the only team in the NFL to not only have a winning record with a rookie quarterback, but, you know, make the playoffs. I don't, I don't count Trey Lance. He, is a backup quarterback in San Francisco. But again, Matt didn't have a great year. They spent the most money they've ever spent in free agency. But I look at the team. Mac has to get better. And I do worry about his limitations. I do think you're going to need to have a really, really good roster for him to win a Super Bowl the way he's playing right now. Now, maybe he will improve and he can, he, his arm will get better. His awareness, I, I, I do think he'll be more mobile than we think. I saw we've seen him run down the stretch. He's not a burner by any means, but I do think he can use his legs to get out of harm's way. Um, so I like that. I think he's, he's got good pocket awareness, but I think he, he he's going to need this summer to reach and watch some film, read some, you know, look at defenses because you know I watched Dan Orlovsky last week on the Mothership, and you know he really points out how defenses are confusing him because. You know, it looks like they're doing one thing. You're playing zone, then you're going to play cover two man, or you're going to spy robber. And it's more difficult for a rookie quarterback who doesn't have the knowledge to really pick up on this. We even see a guy like Tom Brady struggle. When he played the Patriots uh, in week four, he struggled that night because Belichick threw everything at him. He's made, he made it look like one thing after the ball is snapped. It's something completely different. So it's, it's the, those learning lessons for, for a rookie quarterback to come back and get better. And you're also still playing in the AFC East. You expect the Bills to still be a very good football team. But the Jets are still the Jets. Uh, and Miami just fired their head coach. So who knows where they're going with that situation? Um, who's going to be the next hire? Is Tua still the quarterback? Still a lot to be decided. But I, I honestly, I look at the defense and say they didn't really show up yesterday. You know, Matt Judon had a quiet end to the season. 
Kyle Van Noy had a quiet end to the season. They needed more from, you know, Godshaw. They needed more from those guys. Josh Allen had a pretty routine day having time to throw the football. He had a surgical, surgical game. And I'll get into more of this um, throughout the week as, as we preview the divisional playoff games that begin on Saturday. But I don't think he could have played better. And if the Bills have this confidence, which they seem to have this swagger, they seem to have a confidence where Josh Allen says, I got Stefan Diggs. I trust him. But then I also have Dawson Knox, who's a awesome red zone threat. You know, he's my Gronkowski. I got a running back that isn't a Hall of Famer, but he's good enough to get the job done. He, he's starting to get our offensive line, starting to get some holes. He's starting to read defenses better. I got Emmanuel Sanders, who's played more big games than anybody on this roster. He's going to make the catch if I throw him the football. You know it. Gabe Davis is my third down guy. He makes tough catches every week. He takes big hits. He's just a tough son of a bitch. You know he's going to do it. Defense, you got veterans that won a Super Bowl. Micah Hyde, Taron Johnson, Matt Milano, like I mentioned. These guys want it. Jordan Poyer, who's the captain of that defense. They want it badly. They're very talented. So now it's, can we put this all together? Can we beat the team that beat us last year? Can, can we get some payback? The Bills are in a similar position to the Green Bay Packers because Green Bay lost to Tampa last year. In my, if Green Bay, they got to get by San Francisco. But if they want to get to the Super Bowl, I, in my opinion, they're going to have to beat Tampa Bay. You're going to have to overcome that obstacle. Well, Buffalo is not going to have to do it in the NCAA championship game. They're going to have to win another game, but you have the team that beat you last year right in front of you. You're going to the building that you lost in last year. Can you get it done? Arrowhead's a tough building to play in. And it's still Patrick Mahomes. And you look last night, he threw an interception after a great play by, by TJ Watt, who, who gets an interception then he, he gets a, a, a touchdown. He's defensive player of the year. The guy's a stud. But he rallies from that. And Mahomes scored, had five passing touchdowns in a 10-minute and 25-second span. That is the fastest time that uh, a quarterback has had five passing touchdowns in NFL, in NFL postseason history. The next closest time was Tom Brady with over 25 minutes. 15 less minutes yesterday against the Pittsburgh Steelers for Patrick Mahomes. They still have Kelsey. They still have Tyree Kill. Byron Pringle has only continued to get better. You know, they found a little secret weapon in Jarek McKinnon. Last night, he had, he's just a little spark plug. He was in Minnesota for a while, but he had 12 carries for 61 yards. They don't run the ball a ton, but he's used. He had six carries for 81 and a, and a touchdown. They have weapons. And not only that, but they have playoff cachet. Sometimes that's all it counts is, do we feel confident that we can do this? And I think Kansas City does. Touch on Pittsburgh here for a minute. Uh, also, yeah, I guess I'll touch on uh, Vegas, Cincinnati first. First of all, Joe Burrow looked like he was playing in his 81st playoff game. I mean, the guy... He's just cool Joe. You know, he, he wins the game. The Raiders kept it close. They played tough. Max Crosby, that defense. You know, they come into the game, the worst red zone defense in the NFL. The first half, they limited them to three field goals. That was huge. Casey Hayward Jr. had a hell of a game. He should get re-upped by Vegas. He's been cut twice in the last three years. He had, first of all, he had a great season. But yesterday, I thought, uh, sorry, Saturday afternoon, I thought he played fantastic the way he covered on, on guys like he didn't play chase a lot, which hindsight, not a great decision. I don't know why Vegas had Desmond Trufant on who's a veteran who was on a practice squad for most of the year playing Jamar chase man to man Desmond Trufant when he was in Atlanta made multiple pro bowls. He isn't the same player anymore. Casey Hayward is a fit more of a physical guy. So is Jamar chase. I would have went with that matchup. Trufant's a bit taller but he got chewed up and for a guy in his first playoff game in Joe Burrow, the guy in his first playoff game in Jamar chase, they didn't look that way. They, I mean, Burrow threw for two forty-four. Well, 
Jamar Chase had 116 of it, and he had nine catches. You know, Vegas stopped the run, really. You know, Joe Mixon only had 48 yards rushing and 17 carries. Jamar Chase had three on 23. But, you know, Evan McPherson, a rookie kicker, went four for four. That was huge. He lived up to the big moment. Daniel Carlson, also a great kicker, went four for four. But I, I look at the game, and Derek Carr didn't have – he threw the ball 54 times. And again, that's way too many. They only ran the ball 14 Josh Jacobs had 13 carries for 83 yards, six yards a carry. Derek Carr had a 20 yard run. Why aren't you running the ball more against the Cincinnati defense? And you look at Tennessee, Derek Henry's healthy. Even if he's not, Hilliard, uh, Durante Foreman, it doesn't bode well when it comes to that Cincinnati. They need to figure out a way to stop the run. But I do think Cincinnati has a chance to beat anyone. And I said, I don't think they played great on Saturday, but they won. That's all that matters. Next week's a new week. I think Cincinnati can beat anybody in the AFC because of that quarterback. And be, because of he's got great weapons. Jamar Chase, Uzuma, Tyler Boyd is going to make tough catches in the slot. That's just what he does. And I just think Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow is that damn good. He's such – he's the – Young quarterback Justin Herbert's really, really good, but Joe Burrow is just a slightly above him. I Joe Burrow is is just such a good quarterback for such a young guy. Yes, he's played national championship games, but it's not the same. You know, Matt Jones didn't play great in his first playoff game. Joe Burrow did, and you know, kudos to Cincinnati, Henderson, Hubbard. I mean, just winning a playoff game for the first time in a very long time is a big deal for in Cincinnati. And then you, you get to play another game. You take your chances. Next weekend, they head to Tennessee. They'll play 530 on Saturday. Maybe you can pick up a win. It's a tough environment. They're the number one seed. But like I said, I think Cincinnati can beat anybody. I truly do. Because they, they just have that about them, that they're a very, very good football team. So we'll see what comes out of it. But the, you know, the games of the weekend were definitely 49ers, Cowboys, and then followed by uh, Vegas and Cincinnati. Because you had blowouts by the Bucs, blowouts by the Chiefs, and then the Bills just demolishing the Patriots. So we'll see what comes out of it. Big Ben. Um, end of the road for him. You know, his career is over. He's reached the, the end of it here. And it, he goes out losing to the um, Kansas City Chiefs. You know, he didn't play great this year. He wasn't a great quarterback. The team wasn't great. But you also have to give them credit for making the playoffs. And, you know, he'll go out and he had that charge about him about potentially, you know, sexual assault and all that, never went to court. So that, that'll be hanging on him for the rest of his career. But to me, it's not even a debate. The guy's going to Canton, Ohio. He, he's going to have a bust in Canton. He's... He's that good. Three Super Bowls, three Super Bowl appearances, two Super Bowl victories. Um, just the way he played, the way he, he shook off defensive tackles. He's, he's seventh in yardage, uh, right behind Phillip Rivers, who was in his draft class. And, you know, he, it, I just don't think it'd be able to be correct to have a Hall of Fame without Big Ben in it because he's that he's good enough to be there. But We'll see what happens there, but um, you know, kudos to him on a great career. And it'll be interesting to see what happens in Pittsburgh, because if I'm Pittsburgh, this draft is not littered with a can't miss prospect, but maybe they will draft one. Maybe Kenny Pickett will be available. They'll take him, sit him on the bench for a year. And if I'm Pittsburgh, you still have a very good team. You're going to have the defensive player of the year in TJ Watt. Cam Hayward, I believe, will come back. He had a he had a great game last night. Minka Fitzpatrick still very good. Cameron Sutton, I mean, their defense hung tough last night for as long as they could. I just think they were out of gas because Pittsburgh's offensive drives were so quick. But they, you know, Alex Highsmith, they still have a very competent defense offensively. You know, Deontay Johnson is so hit and miss because he's great one moment and then he drops five passes. Chase Claypool. Again, he's another misnomer. You never know what the hell he's going to be. 
I love Pat Fryermuth, the tight end. The offensive line needs work like it always does. And Najee Harris looks like a great, great running back prospect. But bringing in a veteran quarterback would be great because I think Pittsburgh can can make the playoffs again next year. If they made the playoffs this year with Big Ben at quarterback, they could do it again next year. Um, and, you know, I look at a guy who won a game yesterday. I look at porn star Jimmy as a guy that could be a perfect guy to land in, in Pittsburgh because – He's going to, you got to suspect he's got a year left on his deal, but I think he'll be departing San Francisco because they have Trey Lance. They took him through overall, and I don't think they'll want to bring him back. And I think if I'm Jimmy Garoppolo, if they do want me back, well, I just got you to the divisional playoff round. I want to be starting. I'm not sitting on the bench behind a, behind a, a second year, really a, a redshirt rookie who has done nothing. I, I, will, I, I will start in this league for somebody. I think Pittsburgh would gladly take him because he is he a great quarterback? No, but their defense is good. They got a good running game. They have interesting weapons. So we'll see what happens. But Pittsburgh, yeah, for the first time in 18 years, will be searching for a quarterback to replace Big Ben. And it's not on their roster. It's not Mason Rudolph out of Oklahoma State. It's not Dwayne Haskins, who they took a flyer on. He was, wasn't active for most of this year. Mason Rudolph was the second quarterback. So that tells you what they think of Dwayne Haskins. It's not his time. So it'll be interesting to see what they do at the quarterback position moving forward. Um, uh, news here uh, from The Athletic. Uh, it says that the uh, Dallas Cowboys will bring back Mike McCarthy next year for his third season as head coach. No surprise here. Um, you know, it, it's really – I, could, I see why they're doing this because what they would have done in all likelihood is they fire Mike McCarthy and then they make um, they make Kellen Moore, the offensive coordinator, the head coach. So it's the same, it's the same thing. You know, Mike McCarthy doesn't call plays. You know, he runs the clock, he makes bonehead decisions doing it. But to me, Kellen Moore, I don't know why Kellen Moore gets all this praise. I don't think he's a great OC. Uh, his, cre his offensive creativity is not uh, – their offense this whole season has been underwhelming. The defense was the strength. That's led by Dan Quinn. And I think Dan Quinn will not be back in Dallas next year unless he really wants to be, unless he wants to be defensive coordinator. But he was a head coach in Atlanta. He should have won a Super Bowl if him and Kyle Shanahan don't screw it up against New England. So, I, you know, I think having a great year kind of revitalizing his career – coming back, turning around a historically bad defense and then turning into a top 10 one is going to give him a lot of praise. And being a defensive coach, going to Denver, they got a lot of really good pieces there. If he could find a quarterback, potentially, you know, he'd be in Super Bowl contention in the AFC West. So we'll see what happens, but the Cowboys are keeping Mike McCarthy. No surprise. I don't think it's the greatest move in the world. Like I said, I don't think he's a great coach. I, he makes a lot of bonehead decisions that I, again, it's, it's just, that's, that's the Cowboys for you though. They're going to make decisions that you shake your head at because it, it's just, I don't get it, but we'll, we'll see as we move on here. Um, like I said, over the weekend, a lot of other things happened in the world of sports. Um, I wanted to touch on the, the Australian open and you know, Novak Djokovic, we heard Saturday night, would not be allowed to participate in the Australia. His visa got revoked again, so he's now home. The tournament is underway. You know, I understand why Australia made this decision, because they had their citizens in lockdown for 300 days. They were very much, you know, however you want to phrase it, proactive or reactive when it comes to the, uh, the coronavirus. But in any way, they, that's the way they handled it. You know, bully to you. But I know if I was living in Australia and I was in lockdown for over 300 days and some guy was going to just walk through and play tennis when I wasn't allowed to take a shit, I would not be happy. And they, they did it for optics. Now, would Australia, and, and when they're behind closed doors, want Novak Djokovic to compete at the Australian Open? Yes. Because He's won the event nine times because he's the top rated tennis player in the world. 
because he's Novak Djokovic, quite frankly. He's a, he draws people in. But you've got to be fair to your client base. You can't just say, you know, your citizens are more important than one tennis event. So I understand the decision that they've made. It's, it was a tough one. I don't envy the position of their, um, of their press, of the higher ups there in Australia, because you're pissing off a tennis fan base in essence, but you made they made the right decision. It's not about one person. It's about, he's going to leave in two weeks. He's not going to be in Australia. You need to get votes so that you stay in power when he's gone. And the, your radius is way more important than, you know, one, one guy in Novak Djokovic. But I will say, I think the government handled this extremely poorly. Um, you knew he wasn't going to be allowed in from day one. Why even let him come over? You know, this whole two weeks where he's in quarantine, then he's in jail and you know, deportation. I think they could have handled it a lot better and they didn't. Um, so I, I think they should take some slaps in the face today because they look like a clown show. And, if, you know, if you look like a clown show, I'm going to say you're a clown show. But the tournament's off. You know, like I mentioned, the, Aust uh, the women's draw, it's always full upsets. It's always crazy. Coco Goff, the young American uh, out in the first round. Sophia Kennan, who won this event two years ago, got defeated by fellow American woman, uh, Madison Keys, who won the tune-up event last week. So Rafael Nadal cruises, uh, cruised. Denis Shapovalov won in four sets last night. So it's getting, you know, it's getting underway. There's no Novak Djokovic, but Nadal is, is looking for his, you know, uh, 21st major. That should be really fun to watch. You have uh, Daniil Medvedev, who won uh, um, the uh, U.S. Open. So can he back it up? Could he win another tournament? Um, you also, you know, in the field, you got uh, Andre Rublev. I think he's really on the cusp of breaking out. Uh, so lots of great players in Ilya Seem, you know, for, for Canada, Layla Annie Fernandez will play today. So she will be on court um, this evening. If I look it up here, I believe she's on court relatively early. She'll be on at 10 PM tonight um, against uh, a woman from Australia. So, and uh, Simona Halep is here this year. So it should be a fun tournament, but uh, Novak, no Novak Djokovic and we'll have to, you know, live with that one. Um, hockey. Edmonton Oilers lose again. Ooh. They're in trouble. Um, losing 6-4 to, to Ottawa. And yeah, I, there's not much to say. I, I, I just, they don't have good goaltending. They don't have depth. I, they're not playing well as a team. That includes McDavid and Dreisaitl for that matter. But, you know, Darnell Nurse can only play – he's played 26 minutes on Saturday night. He played really well, but he can only play so much. You look at the rest of their defense score, Bouchard played 12 minutes, which actually made sense, but he made the primary error on two of the third-period goals. If you look at the stat sheet, he's minus three, which, as you know, means nothing to me. But if you watch the game, he threw a pizza up the middle to Josh Norris, and then he tried to clear the puck out of the zone, got intercepted. They keep the puck in for 45 seconds and ends up in the back of the net. But he played 12 because he stunk. Barry played 24. That's too many for Tyson Barry. CC played 22. Um, Keith played 20. I mean, Keith, Duncan Keith cannot play 23 minutes at this stage of his career, but he's forced to because they played 5D on Saturday night because they just couldn't play him any longer. They, they couldn't put him in the lineup. So, um, but you got today's also a, a special day. And that is, you know, it's Martin Luther King Day. And, you know, what a great, you know, American, what a great man in general. And, you know, obviously back he was killed and, and such. But to see what has transpired over the last number of years when it comes to social movements, when it comes to the treatment of African and Black people, you know, it starts with him. Obviously, you got to give credit to, you know, and it's unfortunate, but George Floyd, you know, gave his life to, to really show how black people were being treated, how it wasn't, it wasn't fair. It wasn't right in not just the United States. It happens in Canada as well. And guys like Colin Kaepernick, 
who stood up against police brutality, who gave up his NFL career to point this out. And I will be the one to stand on this and point this out the rest of my days running a podcast. He was right. And he was saying this from the beginning, but the NFL blackballed him for pointing out an obvious fact. But today there's, there's afternoon sports and, you know, it's a day just to honor Martin Luther King. He was just a great person. Today you had the uh, Detroit Red Wings rally, scored two goals in the third period. Dylan Larkin scores the OT winner in the NBA. Uh, you also had today some, uh, some action where um, you got the Wizards beating the Sixers. They're about to win that game. The Cavs are up against, uh, are up on Brooklyn. That game's in Brooklyn, I believe. Uh, that game's in uh, Cleveland. Sorry, uh, Kyrie Irving is in the lineup, but Kevin Durant uh, hurt his knee. He's out five to six weeks. That's a big blow. That just means less time for for uh, Irving, Durant, and uh, Harden to play with each other, which, which is worst case scenario. You had the Celtics get past the Pelicans this afternoon, and the Hornets beat the Knicks at MSG as they start to catch fire. Mikael Bridges at 38. Um, he also, uh, the Knicks fall to 22 and 22. So it's been a disastrous year for them so far, but we'll see lots of hockey as well. Right now you got the coyotes are up two nothing on Montreal. Oh, it's a battle for bottom of the, of the seeds. You get San Jose one, nothing over LA. And you also have right now, uh, the abs two, one over Minnesota with 12 minutes to play in the second period. So lots of sports today. We've got the, uh, Final wild card, uh, final wild card weekend game tonight on on the mothership. So we'll be watching that. We'll talk about that tomorrow. We'll, we'll get into more hockey stories as well as I'm sure the Evander Kane story will start to roll in. We'll, I'll talk more about the Florida Panthers, the crazy game, uh, and talk about the Leafs and kind of some other teams that are are making a push and some division races around uh, the world of sports as well. Uh, and also this week, obviously, I'll be back with Seamus tomorrow night. Uh, Wednesday evening, uh, Seamus will join me and Harrison Schutenbeld. We'll talk some NBA. We'll talk about some betting among some other things. And I'll be also having an, an NFL guest uh, later on in the week to preview the divisional playoff games. So um, have a great night, everybody. Uh, another storm here in New Brunswick. So uh, stay safe if you're on the roads and uh, we'll talk soon.